It is with great pleasure. Uh, Uta Wartenberg Kagan, and I apologize for mangling your name, is the executive director of the American Numismatic Society in New York. And she said it would be very, very helpful for her. She would love to tell us about their recent acquisition of an absolutely enormous archives. And uh, working in an archives, <laughs> we commiserate with you, Uta. So without further ado, here she is. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, John had already invited me uh, quite a while ago when this conference was uh, organized. But um, this came obviously as something, I think when the conference was being organized, um, this particular project would have not been possible because we hadn't actually acquired it. It was one of these things that came out of nowhere and what I'm going to talk to you about is really about the acquisition. Um, I'm um, no fool, I know there are many people in this room who know probably a lot more about these medals. Um, and I think what this uh, shows is the material that what we know about the medals is really a very, very small part of this. So, so how did this all start? Um, let's go to the first slide. So I think, I, I remember the day really very clearly when all this started and, and for me it became, um, that's what I called it, a saga. In fact, it was all consuming over the last uh, year. It was the 1st of February um, 2018 and there was an email from Peter van Alphen, our chief curator, came into my inbox, it read, Hi Ute, apparently at the end of the year, MAKO, DBA Northwest Territorial Mint, closed its door and declared bankruptcy. The NYNC, this is the New York Numismatic Club, as you can see from this thread, there was like a very long email thread, is seeing what can be done to recover the dice and possible plasters held by them. As far as I know, MAKO ended up with some ANS dice as well, including those for Weinman's Salters Medal. That was the email. So I read this. Um, there were clearly a number of concerned artists and institutions, um, among them in particular the artist Heidi Wallstead, but also Brooklyn Gardens, the New York Numismatic Club. They were all already on the case um, and were trying to negotiate terms to return of plasters, dyes, and this was all with one of the few remaining staff members at the Northwest Total Mint in Nevada. So then, less than five months after that, the American Numismatic Society was the proud owner, not just of its own dies um, for its few famous medals, we've seen some of them today, but all dies, galvanos, die shells, plasters, artworks, databases, rights to works, anything produced before 1998, which were bought for $420,000, in a bankruptcy court in Seattle. So how did this happen? That's what I ask myself sometimes, why did I get into this? Um, um, those of you who know me know I go in for stupid projects. Um, um, so before the flurry of these emails, which started in late January, a um, few of the regular customers of the Medallic Art Company, um, which was owned since 2009 by a Northwest Territorial Mint, were aware of the serious situation in which the company found itself during the two years prior to this. In March 2016, the company had sought bankruptcy protection in a Seattle court and a trustee was appointed. Attempts to revive the business, which were said to have lost around, and this is a sort of figure, $50 million, failed and by late 2017 the decision was taken to close and move towards a bankruptcy auction of all inventory. So once this became clear to me on this sort of 1st of February, um, I, um, in the morning of the 2nd, I asked my husband to discover, because I know nothing about bankruptcies and courts, 
to quickly look up who was in charge of this. And this took about five minutes, thanks to some sort of business databases that people in my husband's field seems to have access to. And I had a private cell number of the trustee at hand, which I, um, this being quarter to 10 in the morning, immediately called this person, not realizing he was on Seattle time. Um, <laughs> And those of you who know me um, know how I would react. I start to shout at this man, saying, you cannot really sell our dice. You don't have the copyright. And I go on and on for a while. He listened. His name is Mark Calvert. And he said, well, you want to have everything. I said, what, what are you talking about? He said, well, you see, can all the dice. You can have everything. And so I said, well, you mean buy it? And he said, yes. You, I'll." offered to you, to your institutions. Why don't you investigate this? So I thought about it a little bit, and an email came from uh, Paul Wagner, the, the CEO of the company, saying, yes, this was significant. There were about 400,000 items, which was a number that seemed rather large, but it was very unclear what that meant. And it was significant. This is the word that um, was given here. So at this point, um, it was decided that maybe I should, I consulted with the president of the society, Sid Martin, he said, that sounds really great. Why don't you go out there and have a look? So um, our ANS trustee and friend, Mary Lannan, who is here today as well, um, and I immediately set off to February, in February to uh, Dayton, which is about 40 miles outside Reno. And we were received by a skeleton staff at the Northwest Toritel Mint. Um, this picture was obviously taken in summer, but it's the entrance site on 80 Air Park Vista. Um, and we were received by our host, Rob Brook Devine, a former staff member, here in front of the beautifully organized shells. And I would say Rob was one of the heroes in this in many ways because long-time employee of the company, but he also very knowledgeable about this material and really explained this to us that it was important that someone was going to rescue this so it wouldn't fall into the wrong hands. During this first visit, we heard some of the story behind the collapse of this one so impressive company where so many famous artists in America had their medals minted. A dispute with the landlord of the plant had gone to court over environmental issues, which the owner of the property won. This was basically what we were told. Ross Hansen, the owner of the Northwest Total Mint, was so upset that he had a rather inflammatory website set up in which the landlord, and this is here an article in the Wall Street Journal about this story, landlord being a real estate investor called Bradley Cohn, um, was likened to Bernard Madoff. It seems that the origins of this website, which apparently had some other quite extraordinary details made up, was discovered relatively quickly. And if you're interested, that Wall Street Journal article, which appeared this year, is rather interesting. It doesn't actually mention Medallic Art Company, Northwest Total Mint much. They, they faced each other and off in court in what was a now legendary libel lawsuit, which lasted five years and which Hansen lost in February 2016. He was fined uh, $38 million and unable to pay, he declared bankruptcy a few months later on April 1st. Um, Hansen apparently had used similar tactics against other businesses in Nevada. He must have thought uh, this could be successful, but he appeared to have met his Waterloo. It was even to get worse. In April 2018, after an extensive FBI investigation, Ross Hansen and his girlfriend, Diane Erdman, who had worked as vault manager at Northwest Toritol Mint, were indicted for fraud charges. The indictment alleges that both the frauded customers in a massive Ponzi scheme, in which at least 25 million went missing, and this is an ongoing case, 
it's kind of an irony that he had excuse, accused Cohen as a Ponzi scheme, and in fact, that's exactly what he was running. And you can read the details, there's some websites out there. So this is when... But under Hansen's ownership, the Northwest Territorial Mint initially, which ran Medallic Art Company, was one of the separate company, developed a flourishing business with over 300 employees producing medals, uh, challenge coins, and a variety of other um, medallic products, um, little knives and all sorts of things, buckle belts, anything metallic. With a retail shop in the Pentagon itself, annual sales around uh, $200 million. The extent of this operation was very clear from the building of over 110,000 square feet in Dayton. Um, and when we visited this, let me see here, this is the building itself. And here are some pictures from uh, that first visit. Um, here is, an, is one of the uh, more recent Jean V machines that was not in use. Here was a little museum. This is one of the offices. And these, are the most, these were the current dies, most of them much smaller um, of the material. Um, you see here from um, the equipment is also the investment in the company. There was some really high-tech machinery for producing uh, metals. I, this was pointed out to us, an extremely expensive piece of equipment that had Hansen had by, bought in the floor. This is very difficult, the sheer size of this, but this is a huge hall full of minting equipment. It was really amazing to visit. Everything was kept in very good order, in particular the dice, um, organized with numbers. And the same was true for the truly extraordinary collection of die shells and electro-type galvanos. And it was particularly those which impressed us on um, our first visits. Um, about 15,000 of them um, were finally acquired by the ANS and either as old electro-type casts in copper, um, also other metal, or then later copies of epoxy, rubber. Um, and it's really amazing to see the variety, including quite often, you know, this sort of colored in. Um, there's a lot of it we don't really fully understand yet why all this was used. So um, show you a few more pictures then just of random metals and stuff that was in there. Um, and I should say, in fact, having listened now to these so-called dollars, in fact, I think a very large part of this collection is, is relatively small material that was produced. Um, the other thing that is quite priceless, which I have to say, um, rather sadly, not completely preserved by ANS, is the photo archives um, that went back um, a rather long time. Um, they were all... Uh, digitized in very high resolution images. And here's some examples of this, which is particularly interesting is to see who were the people who were given these um, actual pieces. There was a very significant archive, which on the back all identified who it actually is. So it's, it's really quite amazing. We have this largely as digital files. And there are some just you know, the, the variety that is in this is, you know, from rather famous people, you know, here to this um, boy that had to leave, apparently, Germany, leave his pants behind and was given this one of the medals, a relatively common medal. Um, but then also famous, like here, the Captain Rostron of the Capetia, where the dice are still there and were the, um, during the ceremony, um, were in, uh, where this photo is taken. Unfortunately, it appears we searched everywhere for these photos, but because of the ongoing FBI investigation, a very large amount of this material was actually put aside and um, wasn't supposed to be looked at, but we, were, um, we looked a little bit, but could really not find anything um, where these photos were. They were in a relatively small photo, but there are these good digital images. So over the next few months, uh, since this February, um, I began to think this through, and the board basically had given a general agreement 
um, that the sum of money uh, of the $420,000, more or less what we could be spending on this, maybe a little bit more, there was going to be other costs. But we had actually no idea what we were buying because we just looked at these pictures and it was really about uh, two hours we saw this. But it turned out there was a inventory of close to 18,000 entries that was done by the staff um, under Ross Hansen's leadership, um, which was turned into an actual book with each of the medals illustrated. And when um, they had no medal, they actually went and made one. They had the die in most cases, not the medal. So um, we're at the moment processing this as a publication, and we hope to have this out by the end of the year. Um, it, is, it was just a PDF, and it's going to go out as a paperback, um, inexpensively produced, but this is really all there is, because it will take a considerable amount of time to turn all this into a, one of these ANS databases that we have. But I think this will give people an idea what there is, and this will include material up to 2000 and something, so it isn't just up to the 1998 material. But this checklist made it clear this was worth buying, so off we go, we went ahead with this. And um, there was a second major consideration for the um, ANA staff and members, as well as particularly the trustees, which was really the idea that this material could fall into the wrong hands. There was always a group of artists that was protesting here, um, institutions trying to recover their dyes. And there was some real danger that this material and the whole dye group could have left uh, the United States where copyright and other things would have not been enforced anymore. So all this um, appeal to us, um, the entrepreneurial aspect of buying a museum collection through a bankruptcy court was unusual, but actually rather fun. Um, It took much longer than anticipated um, because of various protests, which also drove up our legal fees quite significantly um, because one had to constantly answer various requests. So when the ANAS finally uh, got the approval, which was on the 13th of June 2018, there was really hardly any time to pack up because we were told we had to be out of the building by the end of the month, and this date was pretty firmly set. We had packed up a little bit before, and here it gives you an idea. This was here is just the dies. This is how the dies were stored. And the sheer size of this, this here is about, I think it was 20, three feet high, this, this is, it was enormous. Um, this is how it looked once everything had come off the shelf in 2018. And here, this is a picture where, um, that Joe O'Connor, I'll come, took and how it is housed now um, at Metalcraft, and I'll come to this. Metalcraft, our partner uh, in this, which got the other dies that were post-1998 had agreed to move the entire ANS dye group to Wisconsin. And an agreement was struck that 20% of this dye group annually would have to be moved to get effectively out of their hands. So a decision had to be taken what to do with this material. Then there were the um, archive of medals, which um, I spent 10 days myself packing um, them, um, and at sometimes in presence of other things, and it was sort of interesting. My little friend, the spider, was there pretty much the whole time. Um, when, um, this was an abandoned building, so there was all sorts of other type of wildlife. It was interesting at times. And um, this is how it looked, sort of unfilled customer orders, sitting there with medals, um, basically, it, it was a very sobering experience for me because the lady that occupied this office left the day before Christmas thinking she was going to come back and then never did because they were all laid off. And um, it was sort of an interesting experience, you know, to think about it, how one would feel oneself if suddenly one couldn't come back to one's office anymore to, to clean up. But on the whole, it was fairly well organized. 
So this was packed up, and then there was, of course, the biggest problem, the galvanos, which are on these massive shelves. Um, they had been taken out of the little, the early ones were all in these little sleeves, which unfortunately, um, once I came for my second visit, had been taken out. But um, they had to be packed, and this was really a massive operation here, where without the help of uh, Rob Vogtevin, um, Edgar Chacon, uh, Paul Wagner, Jennifer Baker, the people that were there would have not been possible. We basically organized a crew of students because the idea was that we would ideally take them all off the shelves, these 15,000 objects, and photograph them before we pack them. So, and this is how this would come off the shelf. Um, now let me see whether, this is a little movie, whether this actually works, I don't know. Maybe like this? No. No, I don't know how to get back to this. Um, this is a little um, movie that shows that operation, but maybe that doesn't, it's about a minute long. Ah, there we go. This is how it goes. So these were two photo stations set up with about a dozen students. Um, organized by uh, Lou Manor, who is a well-known food photographer that, um, thanks to Fred Hollerbird, I came across. And um, what doesn't show out when we're in this cool room, it was well over 100 degrees in this room, in this big hall, and worked eight to nine hours a day um, doing this. So you can see there was like, the photos are extraordinary high quality, and that means we have now 10,000 of these fully photographed um, in our, which we just now have to basically create a database for. Yep, now it works, so. Then um, the material here, and this was largely what went to the ANS, was the sample metals that I showed you before, um, was on 13,000 pounds on 12 pallets arrived at the ANS. The um, Galvanos are still in a warehouse in Nevada, um, being nearby, and the dyes that are uh, sitting now in Wisconsin. In total, we estimate that this is, we now don't think in objects anymore, we think purely in, in weight, um, 200 to 250,000 pounds of material. And um, the first thing we did at this point is to think we need help. That's actually why I'm here too. We hired, um, uh, ANS hired immediately a, a young woman who is a specialist on 1930s and 40s Italian sculpture, a little bit on metals, Taylor, Taylor Hartley, who is now working through these various databases. Um, I'd like to also uh, mention that Joe O'Connor and um, his wife, yes, Joe, you can raise your hand, um, will be the incoming um, MAKO, project coordinator, was it called? Some title like this, whatever. Joe's gonna do all the work. Um, <laughs> so, um, as a volunteer, I should add, um, I'm sure. But the question really is, what are we gonna do with this stuff? And um, it's clear the ANS cannot really keep all this. I'm gonna go to my last slide here, end with this. Um, there's a lot of material only been working draw by draw by draw, we find, including in uh, the later material that Northwest Toil Tail Mint, obviously minted material. The 1998 cutoff point was uh, clear for the dyes, but it was not followed uh, for the other material, which um, Metalcraft did not want to have any of their plasters and galvanos, and so this all was given to the anus, including the entire archive samples that included unusual things um, that my um, beloved former colleague, um, Robert Hoke, mentioned the challenge coins. The ANUS is now a proud owner of six to 8,000 sample challenge coins. That these, and if you're all laughing, I, I've become a very big fan of these. Um, actually, you have been for many years. First time I heard um, when I testified in the Senate Banking Committee that Bill Clinton was a collector of these. In fact, if you look at the official portrait of Bill Clinton, it has the challenge coins in the background. He is the only 
This is the only numismatic portrait for our present, so we shouldn't maybe quite look on them down quite as much because when looking through them, I realized when I was offered them that they were actually both historically but also from the iconography and the artistic quality at times su surprising. Not all of them, not bad. So what are we going to do with all this? But in all this, one learns all sorts of things that are interesting here. When we talk about, um, I heard when, when Corey Gilliland spoke about the, um, how medals nowadays are not three-dimensional. Well, here we have a medal by no one other than Roy Lichtenstein, salute to airmail. It's uh, about that big. It is definitely three-dimensional from 1968. When working through this collection, we're going to discover all sorts of things that we really didn't know, and I think it'll be for decades to come. So the question is really, what are the solutions here? What do we keep? What do we sell? What do we, what do, we do with all this stuff? And at this point, I end. Thank you. I answer, oh yes, always. I have loads of questions. I'll start with one and <laughs> give other people a chance. Um, your spreadsheet of 13,000 and change, is that what you got or is that the historical record of what was produced or both? And if not, do you have the mintage figures historically? for um, Medallic Art Company? So the spreadsheet was um, produced by the staff of the Medallic um, Art Company or Northwest Total Mint in the last, um, I believe, five or six years, maybe even seven years. Um, maybe I'll go back to it because if you can... It does not give mintage figures and things like this. So here basically, what we have here, you have a number you have um, a place, you have um, who commissioned it, organization, you often have an artist, I believe, that's there, and then um, it gives very specifically a die and the die sizes. That's how we know the size. But so it doesn't actually say how much was produced. It's organized by decades, so it's in chronological order. It is, it is extreme. When you look at this here, um, this is then in chronological order. Uh, with photos attached to it. Um, it, is, it is about as good as it gets, and that's what the company was using. That's why it says here, you see it says specimen archive proprietary and confidential, not for distribution. Um, that's what they were using internally to check things, and that's why they made this. It's, it's really amazing, uh, working in a museum, those of us know what kind of effort this was. But it doesn't include everything. There is a lot of material that isn't in there, in particular wall plaques, of which there are about six or 7,000. They were not turned into medals, and those are not included. You mentioned not wanting uh, the material to fall into the wrong hands. Uh, but I'm wondering, how, how are you dealing with any ongoing problems of organizations wanting to reclaim their dyes? Um, so Slightly controversial topic in the sense that the court decision is pretty clear cut. Um, we had a, a copyright lawyer involved that looked at all this and actually looked at the various organizations that were making claims to see whether copyright um, was actually registered under US copyright. In almost no case it was. So it's more like a moral right that exists there and we have offered um, any institution or artist that would like to recover their die. And in most cases, there is no material in the more recent stuff because there were no plasters to speak of except a few um, that they could retrieve their dies. It, it's just a question how you then uh, do this because as you saw from the one picture, the dies are just sitting there and actually the few institutions that try to recover their dyes, in one or two cases, I saw these women working with me um, for sometimes days on end looking for one single dye. And in, I know in one case they never found them. So the dyes are sometimes not there. But there is basically an offer you want your dye, 
against the finder fee, you can have your die. Well, no, you can't go in yourself. It's not as straightforward, but there is a cost associated with it, so. Does, does the artist have any right <coughs> to the die? <coughs> no, not if they didn't um, register it or if they have a contract. In the more recent material that sits with Metalcraft, there were some cases where the uh, legislation uh, where well, it's a little different what on the contract was, but um, that's the M American Numismatic Society had an enormous number of invoices um, from really the beginning into the 1980s, and there were different things that were organized there, and unfortunately it doesn't seem that the die itself, it's a little bit, it was compared by the attorneys to the records. You have the right to your music, right? But the record itself, is like, it's just a, is a conduit. So you cannot use that die and start making things. In that sense, in the United States, most of these artists in that sense are protected. But for example, if the dies went off somewhere else, this protection would be very difficult to control, or in fact, impossible, as we know from, you know, Chinese knockoffs and whatever. Um, I was president of the coin club, Tacoma Lakewood Coin Club, when we had our medals made by Northwest Territorial Mint. And I also ordered things myself earlier on. I've known Ross Hansen for about 30 years, and uh, he deserved to have things taken away, obviously, and the court made a just decision. What is sort of amazing, and I knew of this for many, many years after he had purchased all of this material that you're showing, is the amount of product that yeah. you ended up seeing. Uh, yeah. And this was owned by one man. This was not a corporation. Mm -hmm. yeah. This was owned by one individual person. And you know, for all of us in this room here, I imagine maybe some of us could afford it all, but that's a hell of a lot of stuff for you now have to deal with. And uh, yes. I wish you well on that account. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> I know this. You know, it's a completely. I I couldn't agree more with you because when you read about Ross Hansen, in fact, there was a moment I left the picture out when my students were all packing up because the staff was quite terrified of him um, because he's known to them and he suddenly appeared while my people were working there and they sent me like photos of him and then the sheriff was called. Um, during the whole time we were, there was, the main people were heavily armed because of thefts. Um, we were working under extremely odd conditions, I have to say. In fact, Mary Lannan will, will testify, <laughs> it's like saying, why are you so heavily armed? And then he said to protect your stuff because there are people coming in here to try and steal it. But Ross Hansen during this period, that spreadsheet, that's Ross Hansen's work. I mean, not his personal work, but he paid multiple people to do that, and I know how much money that would be. It's in the Pentagon, as yeah. an example, that's where the challenge medals mostly mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. ordered from, as an example. Yeah. And of course, I don't know much more about that, but I'll hand my mic back, I've talked. Yeah. I thank you. Thank you.